from the George Washington University Law School, Tulane University Law School, University of Chicago Law School, University of Nevada Law School, Las Vegas School of Law, all right, University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. Please remember that we will be posting the link to each institution's uh, Zoom room in the chat box 15 minutes before the session is over. And we recommend that you please copy and paste the whole list. That way you can visit as many rooms as you wish. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please write them in the Q&A section and the reps will be answering them at the end of the session. One last reminder is that these sessions will be recorded and available via our YouTube channel in the next week. Um, without further ado, I will hand it off to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Landry and I am the Director of Admission at Tulane Law School. Tulane is located in New Orleans, Louisiana. And my name is Sarah Gonzalez. I'm Director of Graduate Programs at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, and we're located in fabulous Las Vegas. Hi, I'm Shanaz Joshi. I'm Director of Graduate and International Programs at the George Washington University Law School, located in Washington, D.C. I'm Justin Swinsick. I'm the Director of Graduate Programs at the University of Chicago Law School. Hi, I'm Talbot Eckweiler. I'm the Assistant Director at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law located in Concord, New Hampshire. And I have the pleasure to start this, this presentation to you today. So as uh, mentioned, we are going to be discussing, discussing how to choose an LLM program. And we thought that we would give you an overview of what we believe to be the, the big decision. So, um, I have what I believe to be the first and most broad decision you will make when you decide to do an LLM, and that is whether you want to do a general LLM or a specialized LLM. What you need to know is that different schools have different options, and part of your research on how to choose an LLM should be uh, what different schools offer and the different fields. So you might have an idea of what you want to do, you, um, we all have our own interests, our own strengths, our own career goals. And with that in mind, you should start defining if a general LLM is for you or if a specialized LLM is for you. The ways to go about it is you might have, most of you already have law school um, as your background. So you might have done three years, five years of law school. You've had um, a wide, uh, we, you had the opportunity of um, visiting different fields of law at your own law school. Some of you have work experience. And based on that, you might have defined what you like, what you don't like about law school, and based on that, decide what the, a U.S. university might be able to, to help you with. And what, um, for a general LLM, so you have two options, as we were mentioning. The first option would be a general LLM. And the general LLM would be a program that it's very broad um, or can also be focused. But the main uh, characterist characteristic of a general LLM is that it's very customizable. It's very flexible. And what this means is most schools will offer a general LLM that will tell you um, that there's uh, no rules. This means you can pick and choose the classes that you want to take out of the wide range of classes that they offer you. So you can decide if you want to, if you've decided previously that you uh, work for a U.S. company and you want to learn a little bit about what the U.S. does in different fields so you can assist your U, um, U.S. company back home, you can do that. You can take contracts, you can take torts, you can take criminal law, you can diversify your fields of study, um, or you can make it more focused without the specialization, meaning you can decide, you know what, I really like business law and IP law. I can't do those two specializations, but I can't take a number of classes in those two fields. As a general LLM will allow you to do that. 
Um, again, it's a flexible program, allows you to pick and choose your own classes. And another big benefit is um, the US bar. Regardless of whether you're taking the bar, it, it does allow you to take courses that will allow you to focus on a different bar throughout the US. Um, I know that there was a session on bar exams, uh, so you know that there, that's an option for different states in the US. And you, if you take a general LM, you might be able to take courses um, subject of the bar exam that you plan to take. And the other option for the general LLM is um, maybe you've done law school, maybe you've worked, but you are not in love for, with the field of work that you've been doing and you really want to learn a little more about different areas of law. So that's another option for the general LLM. You can um, go and do different areas, even if you're not working for a US company, even if you um, have not made a decision on what you want to do, that does allow you to pick and choose different fields uh, so you can learn more about different types of law and potentially focus on something um, that, uh, on a field that you really like. The difference between the general and the specialized is, is the specialized LLM will be very focused. On a specialized LLM, um, it is a structured LLM and uh, on a specific field of law. And what this means is when you do a general LLM, you have, I received a general LLM from this university. When you do a specific, specialized LLM, you receive, let's say, a maritime LLM, a gaming LLM, a business law LLM. So you get an LLM at the end of your nine months or one year in the US, instead of saying this person got an LLM, you get an LLM in a very specific field of law. The way to do a specialized LLM is the school might set some rules on how you do it, meaning you have a number of credits that you have to achieve and out of that, those number of credits, a number of them need to be in that specialized field. So they might tell you, we offer 30 classes in business law, you have to pick 15 out of those uh, 30 classes, or they might tell you, we offer um, 15 credits in maritime and you have to take those 15, merits, 15 credits in maritime in, there in order to, to receive that specialized degree. But again, it's structured, it gives you uh, a direction that you need to take in order to achieve that specific LLM goal. And I put here some examples for you. Uh, a lot of schools offer LLMs in business. Energy E and E stands for Energy Environmental Law, Gaming, IP stands for Intellectual Property Law, Maritime. D different schools have uh, a wide number of uh, fields that you can specialize in. The other wonderful thing about a specialized LLM, because you might be wondering, so if I have the, the, the opportunity of just diversifying my studies and do an L a general LLM and pick and choose whatever I want, why would I do a specialized? So the idea of having a specialized LLM is, one, you really know what you want to do or two, you work for a company that is very strong in one of the specific fields and you want to show them that now you have extra knowledge on the specific field. The other um, idea be behind the specialized LLM is the schools that offer those specialized LLMs do so because they have a strong, a strong background on it, meaning they have a strong faculty on the field that knows about it and they have a strong network on that field. So if you do that business law course or that gaming course or that maritime course, when you get out of, the, of that program, you can say, I this, did this program in this field at this school and they will recognize the name due to the faculty, due to the network connections. So those are some of the, the strong points on a specialized. Different options, um, a lot to think about when you, when you uh, picking and choosing an LLM, but definitely two big things to take in consideration. When it comes to finding the right program, uh, there are a number of different resources and search parameters that you can consider. So in the United States, there's over 200 law schools. And so you have a number of different choices. 
one element that I always recommend applicants to really limit their search for is to look for ABA accredited programs. And so ABA is American Bar Association. That is the national level of accreditation for law schools in the United States. You will also see regionally accredited law schools. Um, and this is a lower level of accreditation. So especially for international applicants looking at studying in the US, a lower level accreditation may make it more challenging for employment, um, as well as sitting for the bar exam because you already have an international first degree of law versus a, choosing an ABA accredited program. The national higher level of accreditation will provide you the right tools because those ABA schools do have to meet certain, certain metrics. Um, and then make you more marketable to be able to um, sit for the bar and, and look for employment, whether in the US or in your home country or internationally. So when it comes to finding the right program, you may decide uh, the school that you want to attend based on uh, program size. They're, they will vary, and my colleague will go over many of these characteristics later in the session, but the programs will vary. Um, and knowing that you're gonna be part of a cohort or part of a larger established program may be important. Um, you may decide that location uh, may be a parameter for you where you want to limit your search to a certain region in the United States because you have family there. Um, and it may be, uh, that may be the anchor point to help you decide of where you're going, um, the reputation of the program, which you can do on searches. And so when it comes to searching for programs, I'm gonna give you a couple resources on uh, the, on the next slide, but for this instance, you will also look at each of the programs individually because the university website itself will have up-to-date information on the type of conferences or symposiums, how active are they in the community, um, and those are some elements that you want to look at beyond just U.S. News and World Report. Um, and so looking at the extended reputation of the program can be very important when it comes to your search of a law school. Um, look through their course listings when it comes to deciding if you want to general or specialize, what courses will be available to you. Certain LLM programs will make all of their JD courses available for you to select as part of the curriculum. Some LLM programs will limit you to only certain courses, or some specialized programs will limit you to a lockstep cohort model. Um, those are elements that can influence how you decide to choose a program. Um, my background's in negotiation, so I always say reach out to the school and ask them questions because they may say on their website, here are the requirements, but they may allow you permission here and there to take uh, a JD course with permission from the faculty. Um, many of us as administrators for LLM programs are very friendly. Um, so when it comes to finding the right program, I always recommend that you reach out and talk to us, ask us questions about the program. Not only are you getting direct information on the program from the source, but honestly, you're also building a relationship with someone that may be reading the application and, and, and talking to the admission committee about you. So the more information that you can get from the program, um, the, the better your search will be. And then other, um, other elements that could be available for, for programs would be clinical programs or externship programs. Um, different LLM programs will have them built in as a requirement. Uh, some of them will have them as electives. Um, and many LLM programs will allow you to apply for OPT. So there's many different ways to get experience as part of it. Um, when it comes to finding the right program, I always recommend to applicants, even if you're looking for a specialized topic, give yourself a range of options. Apply to a range of different schools. Don't just look at the price tag when it comes to uh, deciding which schools to apply for because that's prior to any scholarship or admission, um, uh, any scholarship offers. Just look at the programs itself and give yourself a number of range of options. When it comes to the cost of actually applying, that's minimal compared to uh, what you'll find out in regards to admission and scholarships at a later point. So give yourself a number of different options and apply for, for a range of different schools. Uh, in the next slide, I'll go over some of the um, important websites that uh, will be a good resource to you. Um, in the next slide. So one of the resources available to you would be the Law School Admissions Council. So LSAC 
uh, has a directory of both LLM and JD programs. So as you're looking and deciding, I really am looking for a small, medium, large school located in this area. Um, the LSAC is a great directory for you to be able to get a start on figuring out which programs will be on your top ten list. Um, you can also sign up for a free candidate referral service. So in addition to putting in your parameters, searching for your school, you can also put in your contact information. It's free uh, for the candidate referral service, and that will give the universities that meet those qualifications that you set the opportunity to reach out to you. So in case there's a school that you didn't find in the directory but actually meets your qualifications, they can reach out to you by being listed in the candidate referral service. Another resource that's available to you is llmguide.com. So with LLM Guide, I look at this more of as an informal chatter in a way. Um, there's a lot of forums, boards where students, alumni, uh, people that have gone through LLM programs will post topics and chat in regards to what their experience was or where they got admission to the program, but it's, so it's great for that content. Uh, with lsac.org, everybody that's an ABA accredited program is in that directory. With the LLM Guide, they do have a paid tier model. So when you do do a search, um, the top, the sponsored programs or the programs that pay money will come first, and then you will have the other programs, uh, other profiles below it. So you do want to keep that in mind. Um, one of the top resources I recommend to applicants looking at a specialized pro program is actually go directly to the source. So the American Bar Association, which accredits many of our programs, actually has the list of all the uh, programs and specializations available listed on their website. And so it is a page that is a great uh, resource for you. And I can show you how to actually go through that website in the next slide. And so once you go to that AmericanBar.org slash groups, hopefully you'll get access to this. Um, but if you follow the bread, uh, breadcrumbs at the top, you'll be able to see the programs by school. And so with this website, it's not a searchable database in the sense that it's as, as clean cut as um, LSAC's website, but you can do a control F and search for that random topic in space law or that random, or find the full list of all the programs offering environmental, uh, environmental law programs. And so this program will list uh, the certificates, the masters, programs, LLM programs, anything that's a non-JD program. And I find this to be the most accurate because as soon as they're accredited, they're up on this list. Um, versus the LLM guide gives us a renewal once a year where we have to update our information. Um, and so this is a great resource to you for those of you that are looking at specialized programs um, or looking if, or if you have a particular institution in mind uh, to be able to look through all their different offerings in one location. Um, but I would pair this up with, once you've determined which schools you want to do, uh, you want to you research, then hop over to the university website directly to look for some of that other information regarding faculty, courses taught, uh, conferences, symposiums, and all these other elements that may influence your decision. Um, the search parameters, uh, again, will give you options to do it by region, but um, there are a lot of different factors uh, to consider when it comes to looking for the right, the right LLM program for your needs. All right, on to our next topic. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys today a little bit about finding the perfect fit. And when you're considering residential LLM programs, you'll want to pay attention to the community surrounding your law school. The United States is a highly diverse area from one region to the next, and even neighboring towns can appear vastly different to the average visitor. Uh, some students thrive when they have access to large communities where they can explore every weekend and never see the same place twice, but other students prefer smaller communities where they connect with their neighbors and develop connections to a particular place. So it's important to uh, reflect on what type of atmosphere suits you best. And no matter what your preference is, there's gonna be somewhere in the United States that meets your criteria. Uh, along the same lines, no two states in America are the same. The US spans nearly 3.8 million square miles. 
And uh, within the country, there are many unique communities and Americans generally think of their home areas as falling into one of three categories of development. Either they're a city, they're a suburb, or they're rural. And cities can be anything from the New York City to uh, Chicago, LA, DC, to quaint, technically a city space is like my home of Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, generally speaking, the advantages of the city uh, is that, well, sorry, the cities are gonna have a higher cost of living than suburban and rural areas, but they're gonna come with more conveniences like public transit and bigger cultural opportunities. Uh, suburban areas are primarily residential and a halfway point between cities and rural communities. They're usually within commuting distance of a major city and often don't have widely available public transit. So you'll likely need access to a vehicle to run errands or like grocery shopping or getting to class. And then the last category, which I think you're probably less likely to find law schools in this area, but rural areas actually account for most of America's land mass. Roughly 97% of the United States land area is within rural counties and 60 million people, about 20% of our population reside in these areas. Uh, so, and so again, it's very important to consider when you're looking at a program, once you've narrowed down your list to consider, you know, maybe five schools, you may want to also look at where they're located and see if those are areas that have the conveniences you're looking for, the cost of living and the climate. Because in America, we have everything from snowy winters up north in like the areas where I am, New Hampshire. And then we have areas that are more arid, warm climates year round down in like the Southwest and Pacific West. Um, and so that's kind of just things to think about when you're looking at the United States, just realize it's not a monolith and that every community and city has a unique uh, things to offer you. So if we can move on to next. So another thing to consider when you're looking at your LLM programs is what kind of experience you can get, you can get outside the classroom. Uh, clinical opportunities in an LLM program allow students to take on real casework under the supervision of licensed attorneys. Often law schools will allow LLM students to participate in these clinics and it's a great way for you to get hands-on experience in the American legal system while you're still studying. Clinics usually center around particular specialized fields of law while also serving the public interest. Often clinic clients are people who otherwise couldn't afford a lawyer. Uh, you can find clinic programs that focus on broad subject areas like criminal law. And then you can also find specialty clinics like animal welfare, uh, animal welfare or intellectual property. Just be sure to check prospective law school's lists of clinic programs to see if they offer a hands-on training in your preferred field of law. And if you're not looking for clinical experience, something else you might want to consider is the extracurriculars that they offer. Uh, extracurricular activities usually take the form of student-led clubs or organizations which are offered outside the classroom. Typically these groups are funded by the school student bar association and each group will elect its leaders for a term of one year. Uh, student organizations can center on everything from the high level idealistic uh, categories like political uh, parties, social causes, or cultural affiliations or they can just be general like specific hobbies like skiing or hiking. Uh, LLM students, if you're looking to immerse yourselves in a law school community, you'll likely find that these student organizations are ideal spaces to network and make friends. So if you're looking for a school with structured social activities, definitely check out their student groups and see if there's something there that really intrigues you. And then my last topic for the day is just, what does your ideal program have the faculty experts in your field? Uh, as you narrow your search, I encourage you to look at law school's faculty biographies and CVs. The faculty will typically list what courses they teach and their recent publications or presentations. And by researching these individual professors, you can gain insight into the depth of the school's programming and its areas of expertise. You might also find a faculty member who you admire or whose interests overlap neatly with your own. And those faculty expertise areas can help you identify whether you'll be able to connect with other professionals in specialized areas of law and because faculty often coordinate events and bring speakers to their in their field to campus. So those are some other advantages that you might find if you're looking in a particular specialized field and you want to find a faculty member that you can really connect and build a special uh, mentorship on with.
So you've heard from my colleagues about what you should be looking at as you're trying to decide what type of LLM program you'd like to um, undertake in the United States. Now I'm gonna go a little bit into the nuts and bolts of the actual application process and actually focus on one aspect. As you've heard, we have close to 200 law schools in the US these days that offer LLM programs. And though the application requirements are standard across the board, where you're expected to submit not only the application form, but transcripts and recommendations, law schools also require students who have obtained their law degree from outside the United States to also prove English proficiency. So that is part of the application process. Now you'll see that there are several tests that are offered around the world. Law schools identify the requirement for English proficiency um, in two ways. One, if you received your law degree from a law school where English was not the medium of instruction, then you would be required to take an English proficiency test and submit a score to show that you have the requisite capacity to undertake a rigorous program that is the LLM. Now, if your law degree was taught in English, but the degree granted institution is located in a country where the language is not English officially, then you would also have to submit. Two of the most recognized tests these days are TOEFL or IELTS, and they're widely accepted by all of the law schools and are administered throughout the world. Next. So you see TOEFL is administered in over 150 countries, as is the IELTS. When you start planning to start the application process, you should look at the TOEFL and IELTS websites to make sure that the test is offered in your jurisdiction and also how often it is offered. Tests can vary in terms of dates and times as to when they're offered throughout the world. And so it is advisable to plan these tests well in advance of when you actually submit the application because most law schools, if not all, will not review your application until all documentation has been submitted. And that documentation does include the English proficiency testing. When you start planning to take the test, obviously you're gonna be looking at whether you wanna do it in terms of the internet-based or paper-based. The tests measure various factors. They're going to have a special section on speaking, on listening, on reading, and on writing. When you take these tests, for example, for the TOEFL, each of these sections will have its own separate score. Then all the scores are tabulated and a final score is submitted to you first, and then upon your request to the institution to which you're applying. So keep in mind that when you are looking at law schools, you need to be also checking to see if that particular law school is only asking for the overall score or is also looking for the subscores of each of these sections. This varies from law school to law school, and it would be good for you to check on their website as to what they require. As I said, some schools only look at the overall score for both TOEFL and IELTS. Some schools actually do look at various specific section scores and make a determination on your admission based on that as well. Most schools require that scores be less than two years when you submit them, meaning that you should have taken the test fairly recently when you are applying to the program. There are many other tests available. There's Duolingo, there's Cambridge, there's Pearson. Again, check with the specific law school to see which of the tests are accepted and then make the determination as to which one is best for you to take. Next, please. Schools will consider a waiver based on a request from you. They're done on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not that there's a blanket waiver that you can submit and the school is going to do, and each law school has the discretion to approve or deny. You can certainly submit a waiver based on your own personal situation and the medium of instruction of your education. 
Keep in mind, however, that citizenship or residency do not come into play with law schools when requesting an English proficiency waiver. For, uh, for example, you may be a US citizen, but you may have gotten your law degree back in Brazil. Based on that, you wanna submit a waiver saying you've been a US citizen, you've been here for you know, 15 years. However, because your legal education was based um, from a Brazilian law school, the law school would probably ask you to submit additional documentation to support that waiver. For example, um, a recommendation from a supervisor at work, which states that you have been working in the English language and obviously um, you know, working in a law firm, writing briefs, et cetera. These are all the things that you have to submit as part of the waiver. In addition, you cannot submit your own score report. When you apply, you take the test and you finish the test, you will get your own score. However, that does not uh, mean that you can only use that to send it to the law school. You must request TOEFL or LSAC to send the scores directly to LSAC itself. We only accept official score reports. In addition, keep in mind that each law school has its own institution code for TOEFL and therefore you will have to check as to what the code is to verify when you request TOEFL to send the score to LSAC. Next slide. When you are looking at doing a law school, we get a lot of questions about how to best prepare for the legal education that you're going to get. And in addition to the legal education, how can you best prepare yourself to learn in English? A lot of law schools offer summer English programs or legal English programs. These are normally offered during the summer and will really allow you to hone your skills, not only in academic writing and reading, but also in conversational English. Basically all the skills you need to transition to academic life at a school. A lot of the programs are gonna give you an overview of the US legal system. And that sort of helps you once you start class to have the understanding and the basis of what case law is, for example, and how to le do legal research and writing, how to write an open memo, how to do a closed memo, how to read a case. So these summer programs can be very beneficial to you. In addition, a lot of them build in professional development activities and cultural. So you'll get to you know, not only explore the city, but meet with the legal community in that city and network. So these have a great benefit to you. And because of that, they're not available just to the LLM students who are entering law school in that year, but a lot of professionals across the world take these classes just to improve their English skills for their careers. Keep in mind, however, that these programs do not count towards your LLM. By that, I mean these are standalone programs and whatever classes you've taken or whatever certificate you've obtained will not transfer into the LLM program that you will be enrolling in. Next. So some tips. There is a lot to do when you're planning your LLM program. It's not only finding which law school is the best fit for you, applying and getting admitted, and then doing all of the visa paperwork, but it's also the other preparation that comes to mind for a lot of students over the summer. And so we often get asked how to best prepare for the LLM. A lot of that has to do with bringing your English proficiency up to speed and honing your skills. Remember, you're gonna be taking classes with JD students. There are some schools where you are gonna be in class just with other foreign students, but a lot of law schools, you're gonna be in class with JD and other LLM students, and therefore these programs are rigorous and challenging, and you're gonna to have to be able to keep up with what is being imparted by the professor in the class. So we often advise you, start talking um, to other alumni, Start reading books on the US legal system, both academic and you know, read some fiction, read some John Grisham. Learn the US legal terminology. Pick up a copy of Black's Law Dictionary and start go flipping through that. Start immersing yourself in English. Watch movies, watch TV shows, listen to radio programs in English. 
And if there is an English language group in your city, join it, practice your conversational English, come up to speed with colloquialism, and then get to know the students in your program. All law schools have a lot of advanced um, informational sessions and get togethers virtually right now. There are WhatsApp groups, there are Facebook groups. Get to know other students in your program and start conversing with them. They're gonna be an amazing resource for you and gonna be lifelong friends. And so it's nice to just get together and start talking in English and discussing how you're gonna face the LLM together. Start writing down new vocabulary words that you find when you're reading. And oftentimes, and this is an actually a recommendation from a, one of my former students, he started an LLM journal. The day he started applying to all the various law schools, and he started writing a journal of, his, of what it took to get through the application process and then what it took to get through the LLM. And he wrote it down in English and he said that was the best practice for him in keeping up with legal and conversational English. So these are some tips and I encourage you to all think about the English proficiency requirements carefully as you begin your applications. Hey, thank you very much, Shernaz. Um, so I will be finishing this portion of the presentation talking a little bit about um, some of the networking and professional opportunities that are provided to LLM students at various schools, as well as some of the things that you need to think about when approaching tuition and costs involved in um, law school in the United States. So starting out with the networking and professional opportunities, um, I think this is a good opportunity for me to uh, make a general pitch for studying law in the United States, um, even, even more broadly. Um, because obviously there are lots of different programs around the globe, but I think it makes a lot of sense coming into the United States because the, the programs that we have here um, have been developed for a very, very long time. Um, and many of the models around the world are based on the US model. And so people from around the globe, professionals, faculty, students, coalesce in the United States. So it's an amazing place to really develop a truly global network. Because even though many of you are gonna return home to your countries to continue your practice, having the opportunity to take yourself out of that context, come to the United States and meet other attorneys from China, from Finland, from Germany, from every corner of the globe is something you're going to be able to take away with you for the rest of your career. And these are going to be people that you're going to rely on for your professional development. So I think coming to the United States makes a lot of sense um, from that professional development uh, aspect. And I always encourage students to really take advantage of the people that you're studying with, because in the end, what you really take away are those people. Um, the alumni, the faculty you're studying with, the professionals that come on campus, that give talks, going to networking events. So make sure that you're taking advantage of all of the, those things. And when you're reviewing schools and thinking about which school uh, makes sense for you, um, I think this context fits in with some of the other topics that were being discussed before, especially with thinking about the, the right fit program for you, whether you're in a rural community, in a more uh, urban or more su suburban environment and thinking about the type of network that's developed at that program. That also fits in with the different types of specializations that you have, whether it's a general program or a specialized program, making sure that you are being, you're going to be able to take advantage of the network of professionals in an area that you're really interested in. So you really need to think about the type of network that you're going to be able to um, develop in the program. Um, you also want to see if there are any kind of interview programs that schools offer. Um, some schools participate in a number of different interview programs, whether they be focused on U.S. or globally, usually globally. Um, but check out different schools, see what they, uh, they offer, and see if you're able to uh, participate in interview programs. They're a great way to get your, your name out there. Um, see if schools offer different kind of externships or internship opportunities as a part of the program um, or as something tangential or adjacent to the program as well. Many students um, make contacts during the, the program and are able to develop those relationships into some kind of internship or an externship if the school is willing to provide um, credit for, for those opportunities. 
Um, now, as I said before, the majority of students that come to the United States to study an LLM program do eventually return to their home countries to um, continue their practice. So I always give the advice that if you're coming to uh, do an LLM program specifically to work in the United States, you really need to think about what that means because there are other hurdles than just coming here, getting a specialization, getting a, a focus um, on US law to finding a final opportunity in the United States. So you need to think about how the program fits in with the broader context of what you want to do, where you want to end up, and the type of work that you, you do want to do. Now, all students that do come to the program, um, if you're under the F1 visa, you do have the opportunity to extend your stay in the United States for one extra year under the OPT, the Optional Practical Training Program. Um, as long as you're doing something that is uh, related to your studies, you can extend your stay in the United States. And many students do find opportunities um, for that extra year because there's a lot less onus on the employer uh, in hiring you and bringing you in for those opportunities. So definitely try and take advantage of that. Um, try and utilize the network uh, that you, you're able to develop during the program to hopefully uh, build something afterwards. Um, and finally, uh, I just wanna mention a few things about tuition and costs involved with uh, US law schools. Now, it's no secret um, U.S. law schools are uh, tend to be uh, some of the most expensive in the, the world, so there tends to be a lot of sticker shock for students that aren't as accustomed to that, especially when you come from uh, a country where education is either free or close to free. Um, so you definitely have to think about the things that are on offer when you're at school when thinking about the tuition that's being charged. So um, U.S. law schools and U.S. universities offer very robust programming, very robust opportunities, um, hire very high level professionals um, like ourselves uh, as the directors of our programs to work with you, as well as the faculty members um, that come onto campus. So there's a lot more that US law schools offer to students. So definitely keep this in mind when you're thinking about the overall tuition costs for, um, for schools. And when you're thinking about the costs, you also need to keep in mind the living costs that you're going to incur as a part of the program. Because sometimes students focus solely on finding the resources to cover their tuition, and then when they come, they don't have the full resources to be able to support themselves during the program. So make sure you're doing your due diligence, make sure you know what the full cost of the program is going to be for you, especially depending on where you live. Um, so cities like New York, Chicago, LA, Washington are gonna have much higher living costs than more rural areas in the, the United States. So definitely keep those things in mind as you're putting together the total cost of the, the program. But um, I would say don't let the, the sticker shock and just the thought of the full cost keep you from applying to programs because there are always opportunities to search for scholarships, whether that be from the schools themselves in the forms of some kind of merit scholarship or a specific scholarship um, for somebody from a particular country or pursuing a particular area, um, as well as external scholarships. And obviously um, right now you're in a great place for that with Education USA. Um, you can talk to them about how the Fulbright program works. Um, also coming from uh, uh, Latin America, uh, having the opportunity to uh, get scholarships from the Organization of American States. I know the Roe Fund um, provides a fairly robust amount of scholarships for students. Um, but do that research. Do your homework. Reach out to schools. Talk to them. And see if you can find a way to be able to finance your studies. Because I will proselytize till the day I die that it really is an investment worth uh, making. Um, it really does help you develop your skills, develop your abilities as an attorney, and really does pay off dividends um, in the end and in the future. So uh, definitely keep all of these things in mind when you're focusing on the overall tuition costs and the possible scholarships that you can, that you can find for doing the program. Um, so I guess now we're going to kind of uh, open things up a little bit for some questions. I know there have been some questions that have already been posted uh, 
and have been answered directly. Um, so I don't know if any of my colleagues see any questions in there that they want to, to answer. We'll just kind of leave this open for a few minutes, I guess. Oh, I would say though, if anybody has specific questions about one of our institutions specifically, leave that for the individual Zoom rooms. Um, we're more than happy to talk about our schools and the wonderful things that we all offer individually, but I think this uh, scenario is best for broader questions that we can talk about um, studying law in the U.S. or what to think about when coming to the U.S. to study law. Um, so first question I see on there was um, regarding the OPT after the LLM program. Um, some OPT can be, others are not. It really depends on the, the opportunity that uh, you find. So it, it's a mixed bag. And I see questions too on which universities offer the best LLM programs in business and corporate law or are you for the, uh, I want to study an LLM in corporate. And that's where the website I recommended, and I don't, I'm assuming you'll get access to this link, um, is the ABA, is that ABA program list for non-JD programs. You will find all the business law programs in there, um, as well as corporate law. Uh, and so that, so it'll actually tell you how many, all the different programs that offer that, whether it's a LLM or I think there are, are even a few uh, certificate programs offered in that as well. But that ABA uh, list uh, on their website will, will be a good resource for you to find that. And there's a question about scholarships. Um, it says, um, I'm a bit confused about scholarships. So scholarships uh, vary very much um, depending on the schools. Some schools will do only merit scholarships and schools will offer both merit and need scholarships. Some schools, um, most schools will give you a decision on the scholarship award at the same time that they um, let you know if you've been admitted to the program. Um, but it's, it's something that you should be able to ask directly to the schools. Different schools have different ways of offering scholarships and you should, when you, when you narrow down the schools that you intend to, to apply, um, I think it, as Sarah was saying, go to the website of the specific schools and those schools will tell you um, how to apply for the, the scholarship if you even have to apply or if it's automatically when you do the application, you're automatically considered for scholarship awards, um, but it very much depends on the schools. And I would add, just to clarify, there's two different types of scholarship. There's an internal scholarship, something that you get with your admission, or it may require a separate essay or scholarship form, um, but that's something that you get from the university. So the scholarships also mentioned by my colleague uh, when it comes to the Roe Fund and Fulbright, that's what's called an external scholarship. That's someone, a third party organization that wants to support your study in the United States. You can get either or, it really varies. Um, in order to really uh, give yourself many opportunities, I would look for both internal scholarships from the institution directly and also look for some of these external scholarships. But keep in mind, some of those scholarships like Fulbright um, do require like a year and a, and a half of advanced preparation. So you do have to apply, go through a sequence of um, interviews uh, to be selected for some of those really competitive scholarships. So even right now, as you're looking for LLM programs, start your research now for scholarships, um, just to give yourself more opportunities. Many of our websites will actually have lists of third party organizations that do provide scholarships. Um, I know I have them on my site. I'm sure my colleagues have them on theirs, but do your research now uh, and don't wait until you gain admission because then only a certain portion of the scholarships will be available to you. So do your research. Also, there's a question on, I'm having trouble finding about loans to international students. Where can I find better information? If the scholarships do not cover all costs, will I have to prove in the application and how will I finance the rest of, of the costs? So um, generally speaking, most scholarships will not cover, cover um, sometimes not even full tuition. Um, and most scholarships will not cover your living expenses. It's not so much a, a requirement of the school as it is a requirement of the US government to know whether or not you have enough money to cover your living expenses. So the way that it, the process works is we will ask you if you, ha if you have money because we have to issue you what is called an I-20, 
which is the immigration document that you need for your U.S. interview. And in that document, it will say that you told us that you have enough funding to, um, to come to the U.S. So it's not so much uh, do the schools ask you that question as it is um, the U.S. government, when you go to the interview, will want to know. About loans, um, I will say that there are loans for international students. Um, most loans for international students will ask you for, you, uh, for a U.S. signer, so um, it can be very tricky if you don't know anyone in the U.S. There are a number of institutions that do offer scholarships without a U.S. co-signer, um, but I will tell you that uh, I learned from uh, a couple of our students that those have been very, very limited um, as a result of COVID. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Um, I, and just to quickly add, several of my students have gotten the row fund from OIS, so I know that's a great resource mm -hmm. to require an application process and letters of recommendation, but that's a zero interest loan. Uh, that's a great resource that you can apply for. Um, depending on what region or country you're coming from, there are some other uh, government organizations that may provide uh, additional loan options or grant options for applications, but again, depends on the region uh, that you're coming in from. And I mean, don't be shy as well, it, depending on obviously where you're working, um, speak to employers. Um, we've had many students that have had support from their employers, whether it's in the form of some kind of loan or uh, a scholarship. Um, so I, do, your, do your due diligence, do your homework, and don't leave any stone under, unturned. Uh, let's see, I see a question about, and this is a, like a second question about lists and rankings, um, a top list of LLM programs. So obviously there's lots of rankings out there about law schools in the United States. Um, none of them focus specifically, or if they say they focus specifically on LLMs, I'd say that's not really a, the, the full truth. Um, the most rankings are going to focus on either the law school as a whole or metrics that are provided from the JD program. So based on the, the students that were admitted to the JD program. So um, when you're looking at programs, definitely think about the specializations, the focus, the faculty that they have, um, and where they are and the fit for you, because you want to make sure that you're getting the best out of the program itself and not just basing it on uh, a number that was um, created by, in most cases, uh, some kind of publication that's trying to sell something. There's a question if my law degree was not taught in English, but I now live in a country that has English as an official language. Do I have to take the TOEFL? Yes, if your law degree was obtained in a in language other than English, law schools will require you to pro provide an English proficiency test score. Um, a couple of questions about corporate LLMs. I'm just kind of uh, focusing on what Sarah was saying before, um, definitely go to the ABA or the LLM guide uh, and you can find like really long lists on different programs that offer specializations in that area or that have a lot of courses or faculty that teach in, in those areas. So those are, those are fairly um, readily available to, to everybody. Uh, and then there's a question about um, the process of admission for LLM and corporate law. I, the process themselves are going to be fairly similar from school to school. Uh, you definitely want to take a look at LSAC because the majority of schools in the United States are using LSAC as the platform to receive applications. Some schools require you to go through LSAC, others do not. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're going also to the individual schools that you're interested in to make sure that you're following their processes. Uh, the links for the rooms are on the chat on the right. Um, if you go to, instead of the Q&A, if you go to the chat, the links for the schools are there. I think someone from Education USA posted it. There's a question about which universities allow transfer LLM to JD. Um, that will depend from law school to law school. That is not across the board. So you would have to check with individual law schools that you're interested in to see if they have an LLM to JD transfer program. Okay. 
And then I think I just copy and pasted the Zoom webinar um, chat into the Q&A. So hopefully that person that doesn't have access to the chat can see that. Uh, there's one last question, I guess, about bachelor's mark or schooling mark matter for admissions. Um, like generally speaking, yes, I, schools are going to take a look at your academic record, but um, schools are looking at a wide variety of things uh, in addition to your, your academic mark. So they're going to look at your professional um, experience, your fit for a particular program, your um, desire for the program, letters of recommendation. So that's one amongst many, many factors. But also use that personal statement. So if your marks are not where it, where it was, something happened, or whatever the case was going was happening, uh, where you were distracted for that term, use that personal statement to help us understand what was going on. And again, depending on your um, whether or not you're a recent graduate or maybe you graduated law school 10, 15 years ago, it's all taken into perspective as a whole for the applicant, uh, what your marks were. And then there's another question on, I'm having Indian law degree, what's the process for admission? Uh, same for any international students from the various locations. Um, law schools receive applications from locations all over the globe. Uh, and so again, as my colleague mentioned, you can either apply through the Law School Admissions Council, which will allow you to submit your materials to one location and then send them to the five, six, seven, ten 10 different schools or uh, apply directly to the programs for those that accept them directly. But, um, but no matter the location, you have, it's a similar process for each. All right, I think those are all the questions. Thank you very much for being here and sharing this information with us. Um, we invite everybody to join the different Zoom rooms. The links were put in the chat and also in the Q&A box, so you can find them now. We recommend that you copy and paste all of the Zoom links. That way you can join as many uh, universities as you'd like. Uh, we want to remind you also that tomorrow is our last day of the LM webinar series. So um, it'll be in the afternoon and we'll be discussing um, tips on writing the personal statement. Uh, so if you want to learn more about that, we invite you to join. So thank you all for being here and join the different Zoom rooms. And yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.